everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the Developer Live q and I'm Aja. And a reminder that this Q&A is live. If you want to join the conversation, reach out on Twitter with the hashtag Google Cloud Next. We've reached out asking for your questions on social media, and y'all have been responding. We'll be answering your questions during the next 20 minutes. And first of all, let's welcome Priyanka, who's here to answer your questions with me today. Hi, Priyanka. Thanks, Aja. That keynote was absolutely amazing. Yeah, so let's get into the goodness that Urs and Aparna shared. A highlight for me was really that upcoming documentary on, on Kubernetes. So cool. I also enjoyed um, the Google Cloud Innovator community announcement, securing software supply chain, and building sustainably. Uh, what caught your eye? Oh, a lot of the stuff you just mentioned. Um, definitely our innovations in sustainability. The ability to see your carbon footprint of your cloud workloads is really, really cool. When I heard about it yes in yesterday's keynote, I immediately went and looked at all my personal projects to see the carbon cost of what I'd been doing. And I love having that kind of data to use in decision making. Like, help me make the right decisions. Uh, but I'm mostly really excited about the Cloud Innovators program. I've really missed interacting with our Google Cloud Dev community. I want to hear and see all the amazing things the community's been up to. And the Innovators program should let us do that. And we're working on some super special Innovators-only events in 2022 that I can't wait to tell the community about. Wow, yeah, that all sounds really amazing. I'm also excited about that secure supply chain announcement, Salsa, <laughs> and how the combination of cloud build and binary authorization actually helps kickstart your journey to secure your software artifacts by fully automating that build process. Yeah, that's just so interesting, that's so cool. So let's get to our first question. We've got the questions coming in. Uh, just for the folks at home, the backstage crew is looking for your tweets as well, so keep them coming in during thing, and we'll be bringing them in live. So our first question is from Asher, and it is, who would be good candidates for the per per yeah, participation in the private preview of Earth Engine? Yeah, so um, anybody who is like doing work on sustainable things, right? So with a sustainability lens, if you're thinking about financial services, um, the customer packaged goods and their impact on the environment and how all of that can be combined together. So um, yeah, anything that, that you're doing with a sustainability lens, obviously it's in private preview, okay. so you have, to, uh, you, you have to qualify and stuff, but, but if you have that angle of sustainability, you're probably a right fit for it. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, second question came in from Priyanka's Twitter, and I saw this one this morning as I was coming in to do this Q&A. And this one is, any examples, do we have any examples of end-to-end -end Spark based pipelines for ML? They'd love to see them. Specifically, they're interested in learning how serverless Spark can be leveraged in big data and ML ops framework on Google Cloud. Yeah, so um, uh, thank you for this question. I think it came from Prana. I saw my Twitter this morning. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, really what it's all about is the serverless Spark ML framework is, is about you not having to create your backend infrastructure to run Spark. So that's all taken care of for you. So you can just run your workloads, which is in this case, like you're, you're trying to run a machine learning Spark job. You can just okay. get started by not worrying about the infrastructure. So that's one part. The other piece of it is the, ML, the Vertex Workbench, um, which is the uh, Jupyter Notebook, but, but hosted. Uh, but it also gives you the opportunity to connect with Dataproc or the Spark ML jobs that you might have built um, and, and all, run all of that. So as a data scientist, I can just use my workbench, and that becomes my home to kind of get the data, massage it, you, connect with data proc, Spark ML jobs, and then and then get all those um, predictions right in that one spot. Awesome, thanks, Priyanka. That was a really comprehensive answer. Ah, so now we have a question from Christopher, and it's, what are the benefits of the Innovators Program? You mind if I take this one? Yeah, please. <laughs> so the big benefit of the Innovators Program is going to be access to Innovators-only events. Like, we're going to be doing some AMAs we're planning right now, roadmap meetings potentially. And there's also an Innovators virtual background that you can download and use in your Google Meet meetings. Uh, ooh, another question came in from Twitter. Awesome. So let me read this one. My POV, massive focus on the security, massive focus on the security focus in the developer cloud. Isn't this a topic that matters more for the managers of developers than for developers? 
And I'll take this one too, if that's cool with you. Yeah. So I'm a manager, and yeah, that's a really good question. Security is vital to all aspects of software development, and security needs to be everyone's job. Yeah, managers need to care a lot about it, but we need to make the tools so that developers can do the right thing automatically and that everyone is participating in making our cloud more secure. And we talked about some of those things. We talked about our tooling that can help you make sure that you put your secrets in secure locations as opposed to putting them in code. We talked about the salsa. We talked about lots of other parts. And all of this is part of a secure software supply chain, but security does need to be everyone's job. Managers can help by teaching their developers and enforcing it, but everyone needs to take the steps to make things more secure. So yes, good point, but everyone's involved. OK, this is a great one from Priyanka's LinkedIn. Uh, is it possible to connect to the public IP of a cloud SQL instance from a private cloud run service? Oh, I've been asked this one before when visiting customers. Yeah. Also, is this, cro this cross-project setup? Cloud run service and a cloud SQL instance are on separate GCP projects. So can you do a cross-project setup with your database and your running service somewhere else? Priyanka. You, you actually can. So you have, so in this scenario, you have a cloud SQL instance in one project, and you have, um, your, you have your compute or whatever is calling that cloud SQL instance in another project. And you could totally make them work by using um, what is called as private Ser uh, private service access. What it does is it connects the two together even with a private IP. So you don't even have to expose a public IP for your, for your cloud SQL instance, which is again comes back to the security point you were making yeah. earlier. Everybody has to think about security. So you're not exposing with public IP. You're just using the private IP of your cloud SQL instance and connecting it to the virtual machine or uh, wherever you're running your compute. Uh, to call your service from. So it's possible private service access is the service you're looking for to kind of connect the two together. It's a VPC offering. Awesome. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Cool. A question from Andy. Oh, this is one of my favorites. So there's a lot of ways to run an application on Google Cloud. It's a huge platform. How do I know what, to sh what I should choose? Where do I run my stuff? Should I run it on GKE, Compute Engine, Cloud Run? So many good choices. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is a question we get a lot, right? And it's um, it really just depends on your situation, and the situations can be a lot: the type of team, the size of team, um, and the number of uh, number of developers you have, and and the and the languages that you might be using. So um, there are lots of different scenarios in which you can decide. So I'll give an example of a few. Okay. So for example, Compute Engine. Like if you're migrating and you just want to get from on-premise infrastructure into to cloud and you just want the speed, you just want to get there. Um, I would choose Compute Engine to just migrate as is and then modernize later if needed. Sometimes you don't need to modernize if you have licensing yeah. requirements and stuff like that. Um, so that's Compute Engine. The, um, if you want to work with containers, need a little bit more abstraction, less abstraction, um, you can work with containers with GKE um, and that gives you a lot more control over the number of nodes you have and, and the processing that you're using. Um, but if you might be just wanting to run containers, but don't want to manage the underlying infrastructure by like nodes and, and stuff like that and the regions, just use Cloud Run because it's serverless, but it allows you to uh, use your container, uh, container images and just deploy them. Um, Cloud Functions is kind of like everywhere so you're trying to do handle one function uh, or a piece of um, a piece or a feature of code that you just de just deploy in a function um, as a as a function as a code sort of service uh, but it kind of applies everywhere so I wouldn't say uh, so cloud function is not like a or uh, it's yeah. more of an and, like it works with, with any of those. It's just more of an extension and enhancement of your services with serverless. So I hope that that helped clarify a little bit of that, but there's a lot that goes in that decision. Yeah, I know, and I really liked how you called out that Cloud Functions is not an or, it's an and. It's, cloud Functions is just fantastic at tying pieces together. It's one yeah. of the things I love about it. Um, and I'm just going to point out for folks that we have sessions on all of these in the breakouts. So if you want to go learn more about these, go look in our breakouts and you can find out more about the different offerings that Google Cloud has. So now we have a question from Esther. What languages do Cloud Run and Cloud Functions support? Oh, let's see if I can do this from memory. I've been practicing. <laughs> uh, so GCF, these are the standard languages you see on Google Cloud. We've got Node.js, Python, Go, Java, .NET, Ruby, and PHP. I got them all. Awesome. 
uh, Cloud Run supports any language or any library or any binaries that you can put in a container. But if you want to use the source code deploys feature that Abby showed earlier, that is supported on Node, Python, Go, Java, and .NET. And specific versions of those languages are supported, so please do go to the website and make sure the version that you need is the one that we support. Great memory, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been getting really good at naming all those languages. So from Selena, ooh, yes, great question. When should I use GKE Autopilot versus Cloud Run? Um, I'll let you take that you're one. You're going to let me take yeah. this one? OK. So this pretty much boils down to, do you want Kubernetes or not? If you want Kubernetes, if you want the enhanced flexibility that Kubernetes has, if you want to have all those knobs and dials that you can turn to really fine tune everything for your networking needs or your particular load profile, use GKE Autopilot. If you, want to if you have a container and you want to run it on GCP and that's your goal, Cloud Run's great. Cloud Run's fantastic at that. Uh, and as we pointed out, you don't even need a container if you use Cloud, Cloud Run source deploys for those languages I just mentioned. More questions. Ooh, this one's for you, Priyanka. Uh, this is from Caleb. What file formats are supported with the doc AI stuff that Anu talked about? Oh, yeah. So um, you can do images and PDFs. It's really about the unstructured um, image data, so PDFs and, and images. Awesome. OK, let's see what else we got. Ooh, this one's from Mark. Another one for you, Priyanka. Ooh, it's another security question. So can you tell us more about binary authorization? We covered it very briefly in the keynote, but it's something I've been hearing a lot about, and I'd love to know a little more about it. Yeah, so again, it kind of boils down to the whole like security narrative that, that you mentioned, that everybody's kind of responsible for, um, for the security of um, the entire platform. So in this case, um, but with binary auth, it's really deploy time security. Okay. So you're deploying um, and making sure that your images or container images, if you're using um, GKE or Cloud Run, uh, works with binary auth. So when you're at your deployment stage, uh, you, have, uh, you, you can provide signature authorization on your images um, so if uh, and the and the um, and the verification and the authorities for those so if they are if they are authorized only binary auth will apply the authorizations and once the image is authorized only then you can deploy it awesome so I just got the signal that we're running out of time so this is gonna unfortunately be the last question uh, and this question comes from Wesley can I use the build integrity features with my on-prem software? Huh. Okay, yeah, so um, you kind of can. So um, with Cloud Build, um, it's really any container image which is built on uh, um, cloud build, you can use both on, you can use it in both on-prem or on Google Cloud. Um, you just have to use the binary, at, at binary auth attest, attestation cloud build. Um, and um, it's on, it, it's on the GitHub page, so you can check that out. But if you're building it with, in cloud build, um, you can deploy it on-prem or um, in Google Cloud. Thanks, Priyanka. Well, that was a lot of fun. It was great to hear all the questions from the audience. Y'all had some great ones. And I want to say just a huge thank you to Priyanka for joining us and answering so many of those questions. Be sure to join us back over on g.co slash cloudnext as the Open Infrastructure Spotlight will be kicking off shortly, and they have some amazing things that they're going to show off. Thanks for joining us, everyone.